So what do you think the future holds for life? The future for life? Um, global warming, uh, Skynet taking over, uh, the human species just being obliterated. But on the flip side, we've got ES6, so it's all going to be okay. Everything, everything worked out great then. It's going to be great. Anyway, you were all right. ES6 is awesome. It is awesome. Like, I, I guess the one thing is at the moment is you can't, you can't just use vanilla ES6 in the browser like right now. I think so. We've been, we've been landing a lot of ES6 features in Chrome and V8 over the last couple of years. Other browser vendors have been doing an amazing job of this too, but we're not quite at the point where you can just, you know, use it in production without requiring transpilation. Um, and yeah. on that side of things, a lot of people probably need a good transpiler. I think most people are using Babel at the moment. Yeah, so that's usually pretty, popular one. Pretty legit. And if you're using Babel like, and, and you're trying to get it into your build process, what we probably use are you know, things like Gulp Babel, just a few lines of code, get set up. It's very, very straightforward. But uh, I think you've been, you've been playing around with Browserify and Babelify for like bundles, right? Yeah, so the only reason I'm using both is Browserify will grab any of the imported files and bring them all into one so that when you run it through Babelify, it's got everything just in one place so it can just munge it all together. Um, and that seems to be working out okay. Like the one thing that you see in a lot of tutorials is people would just say, define your script file and then run it through Browserify and then run that through Babel and then everything will just work out. And it's just for that one file. And that's fine, but the minute you add another file for a separate page or something, it doesn't, everything just falls apart. Yep. Um, so I've had to do a little bit of work there where it's just like I'm using glob.sync to basically just go through a set of files in my build process and it looks for just .esx.js. Yeah. And okay. those files will then get run through like Browserify and then once it goes through Browserify, it gets said through Babelify and then it creates the files. That's legit. So I've got like a nice little workflow going right now so that I can just write ES6 and then everything's like ready for the server and ES5, good to go. Cool. So um, the first step is transpilation. We've also got, so one thing we need to do usually is both lint our code and style check it. Mm -hmm. Now what I've been mostly using for this stuff is like I've, I've used JS hint pretty heavily in the past for code, style, for, uh, code linting. Um, and JSCS for code style checking. And JSCS 2.0 now supports like Babel, so you can style check your code. It also has a number of ES6 only features, which are kind of nice, like ES6 only rules. So let's say I've got some code that's using string concatenation. I can actually add a rule to my JSCS config and say, well, I want that code to be using template strings instead. And then like throw a little exception and say, you know, you should, oh. you should be using template strings. Nice. If you wanted to do things like, oh, okay, in this case, you could use the fat arrow function, force that as yep. just a linting rule. Yes, exactly. Nice. It's just kind of sweet. Um, on the, the linting side of things, there are a few people that have been like switching over to using ESLint. Um, it's a, so ESLint is a tool by Nicholas Zakis that tries to combine some of the features you'd find in JSCS and, and JS Hint. But it's a little bit, it, one could argue it's a little bit more future facing, tries to um, support ES6 a little bit better. I still personally use JS Hint and JSCS. But ESLint is, is really solid. It's a, an option a bunch of people are using, so nice. it's worth checking out too. Yeah, like I've, I've still just stuck to JS Hint and JSCS logic because like, that's what I'm used to. Yeah. The only thing I had to do was add in the ES Next True into JS Hint RC and JSC. JSCSRC <laughs> file. So yeah, ES next true, and then all the linting rules just started working. Like it, everything that it was complaining about suddenly just went away, and it's just like, oh, okay, we're using a class. That's fine. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, that, that has basically been my setup process, which has actually been fairly simple once I got it all set up. Um, like the, the major feature that I'm just in love with is the fact that you can have um, a file with a function or a class, and you just basically set just define like an export saying this part, this function or this class is allowed to be exported and imported by another, another class. Mm -hmm. And that alone I've just fallen in love with. Just everything to do with um, ES6 modules is fantastic. Ability to import, which means you can then extend um, one of your classes with the other one. And then just all the boilerplate for this dot prototype. Yeah. Just like getting rid of all of that and just defining a function. Like my code, I'm so much happier with how much cleaner it looks. And like because I come from a bit of a, like a Java background, like this is just like so super friendly to me. It's insane. 
Like, what are your favorite features in ES6? I'm not going to critique you for, for Java too much. But, like, my, my features are, my, so what, I, what do I like? I like everything. Um, I kind of like template strings. They're neat. But uh, object, so the, so the shorthand object literal stuff, mm. super neat. A lot less boilerplate involved. Um, I love uh, computed property names. Yep. Having that in the language is amazing. Fat arrows are neat too. Weak maps, weak maps and weak sets. Um, but I did want to name drop one or two things. So um, another name drop, Addy. You're shocked. Really? I know you're shocked. So I'm surprised you're not wearing a T-shirt with said name drop right now. No, no, I've, I'm wearing a, a T-shirt that, that says "Never Forget Floppy Disk." <laughs> um, Never forget. So uh, I, I put together a repo called ES6 Tools that tries to summarize the whole landscape of tooling for ES6, ES 2015, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It tries to capture like stuff that you need for grunts and gulp and you know all the polyfills you need and all that other fun stuff. So it's kind of like depending on what your setup is, you could go to this and it would just list down all the things yeah. that apply to you right yeah, there. Yeah. That's then. the idea. Nice. But I also wanted to mention. So there's two really good. Um, books that are free to read online if people want to learn more about ES6. Mm. Uh, the first is Understanding ES6, which I've, I've been reading a lot. It's by Nicholas Zekis again, um, solid book. And there's another one called Exploring ES6 by Axel Rashmer. Uh, both solid books, both really, really knowledgeable guys. Uh, so yeah, people should check those out. Yeah, like I've loved it. Like the amount of like code that you can delete just from a ton of these features and just the maintainability feels so much cleaner with this kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely love it. For me, I think everyone should be checking out ESX and just playing around with it. Like, like I said, for me, like it just makes everything much more like Java, which I love. It, what? What? It? No, no. We're we're taking ESX away from you. You're just no more no more Babel for Matt. 